Good evening from uh, Geneva. Uh, good afternoon uh, in the US. Uh, thank you uh, for joining us. Uh, this is one of uh, the most exciting uh, discussions uh, during our Davos Agenda Week. We're at the uh, tail end of this week. We have had more than 50 million people uh, watching or following us uh, in one way or another. But uh, the interest uh, for the US is still extremely high. US is the largest economy in the world, uh, about 25% of the global uh, GDP. More than 40% of the global military capacity uh, is still in the hands of the US and all the big tech companies, US dollar is still the reserve uh, currency of the world. And um, President uh, Biden has also now called for all democracies to form an alliance together and he will initiate. So we have um, one senator and three representatives that can give us uh, the best insight also in uh, where we will see U.S. going, U.S. Uh, foreign uh, policy, so we can't wait to start. Of course, we know that uh, there is uh, not uh, a lot of um, collaboration necessarily uh, in the Congress. Uh, bipartisanship is maybe not what it used to be, but let's see. Uh, maybe there is a more agreement uh, than uh, anticipated. I remember the first time I entered the building. I was a young politician from Norway invited as a group, and we were sitting with a fire chat uh, talk with uh, Speaker Tip O'Neill. And he said to us, when I was elected, my old father in Boston said, Tip, it's nice to be important, but it's more important to be nice. Is this something that is lost in US politics? Let's start with um, Senator Kirsten uh, Gillibrand. Uh, Kirsten, so great to see you. You were a distinguished candidate, candidate also during the primaries. Uh, you've been a senator, I think, since 2008. Is there room for being nice anymore in the US? Will this change again? Because we used to look up to you guys in every aspect before. Absolutely. And what isn't reported on much is how bipartisan the Senate actually is. Um, every Congress, I author dozens of bills that are all bipartisan, widely bipartisan. Uh, but one of the reasons why I was so uh, active in trying to flip the U.S. Senate so that it could be run by Democrats was that I wasn't often given votes by Mitch McConnell. So despite the last eight years of dozens of bipartisan legislation that if there was a vote called could have passed, we were not given that opportunity. So I'm really optimistic uh, to have a Biden administration where a lot of the reforms that I work on uh, in the Armed Services Committee, um, domestically on the Ag Committee, on the Environment and Public Works Committee, infrastructure bills, those are all deeply bipartisan issues. And I know now I'll have a chance to actually get votes on them. And I will have large numbers of Republicans supporting the legislation that I author. So I'm optimistic. And uh, we, we don't re hear a lot of reporting on it, but uh, we do get, I mean, I my work on military sexual assault is supported by Mitch McConnell, by Ted Cruz, and by Rand Paul, and Bernie Sanders. So that's the kind of good bipartisan reform work I think our country really needs. Well, that's like squaring a circle, it seems like. <laughs> You, you made it. I, I was just wondering, where do you think we will see uh, the most immediate changes uh, on the foreign policy side from this new administration? Of course, we know that President Biden uh, re-entered on behalf of the U.S. the Paris uh, Agreement, but I'm thinking on China, trade, uh, are you going to uh, pull out the troops from Afghanistan and Iraq as President Trump uh, planned, a uh, relationship with NATO. There's so much to discuss. Absolutely. Uh, the first thing that's changed already is that President Biden is going to reassert the United States role in the world. Um, I was at the Westlessness Conference, uh, the Berlin Security Agreement Conference, and, and I can tell you that um, there was a lot of concern that America had stopped leading in the world and that Europe and the EU and the rest, excuse me, the Munich conference, Europe and the rest of the world would um, uh, ignore the United States views on certain things. And that's something that Vice President Biden, when he ran for president and now as the president, is going to do. He's not only reasserted himself on global climate change with the Paris Accords, 
Uh, he will re-engage with the Iran uh, nuclear deal, uh, engage all of our allies. He will make sure that our allies know we will stand ready with them on national security. He will renew our relationships with our allies. Um, the president's already reached out to Canada, <laughs> the relationship that suffered under the Trump administration. Uh, he will be re reaching out to the EU, to NATO, uh, to, to assure our allies that we will once again um, stand with them to make sure that we are going to project leadership and strength. And I think he will have a very different approach on engagement with both the, the Middle East, but also with China and Russia. I think we need far more engagement that is productive um, with both of those uh, countries. And I think President Biden has a very robust agenda to create international norms and more secure national security. I think he is going to engage Russia immediately on nuclear treaties. He will engage China immediately on economic issues uh, and to try to make sure that human rights is part of our international uh, norms and part of our international conversations. Well, thank you so much, Senator. I would like to turn to Representative uh, Ted Deutsch. Um, you're uh, also uh, very much um, involved and knowledgeable on the Middle East. We, we met before uh, at uh, the Dead Sea. And uh, Congressman, um, the former administration initiated this um, Abraham uh, Accords. It seems like this administration um, will also follow up on those, but we saw also some new policies. Uh, yesterday it was announced that there will be a moratorium on uh, some uh, export to the UAE and uh, Saudi Arabia, um, F-16s and etc. Uh, an assessment uh, of the policies. So what do you expect um, of uh, changes uh, on Israel, on um, the Palestinian issue, but also when it comes to uh, Saudi Arabia? Uh, well, thanks, Borgia. I'm happy to answer the question. I guess only one of us gets to talk about whether being nice still matters. So I'm glad, I'm glad that uh, the senator got that one. Um, look, uh, the, the challenges in the Middle East remain the same. The, the, at the top of the list for the United States and for the region uh, is Iran and, and Tehran having expanded its nuclear arsenal during President Trump's term, uh, enriching uranium to higher levels at Fort Dow and producing half a kilo per day. And uh, the images of a new centrifuge assembly plant under a mountain in the Tons threatening to end international inspections, all of that matters. And, and so that's going to be a place where uh, the United States will work with our allies, will work with Israel, will work with the Gulf states, uh, will work with the Europeans uh, whose interest in, in Iran, particularly the precision guided missile program, uh, is, is real. So uh, that's going to be an immediate focus. And, and you've seen the conversations over the past few days uh, of the, the need for Iran to come into compliance with the deal. And then the United States uh, moving forward diplomatically, and I know we'll have more of an opportunity to talk about that more broadly in the region. I think that the actions that were announced uh, just this week are important. When it comes to Saudi Arabia, there is a uh, uh, the, the reexamination of the uh, arms sales, the uh, taking a, a pause to reassess. Um, both the importance of the relationship and the importance of American values being front and center in that relationship. Uh, that's something that's consistent with the way that the Biden administration is approaching foreign policy as a whole, really leaning in with our values. You talked about, Borge, the importance of uh, democracies to this administration. Well, so too the importance of human rights. And so I think that's going to be uh, a big topic of conversation initially. Uh, some of what the last administration d did to try to bind the hands of this administration, I think, will require uh, an examination, a re-examination. Um, addressing the humanitarian crisis in Yemen is something that we need to focus on, again, together and, and not within constraints imposed in the final moments of uh, Secretary Pompeo's uh, tenure. So um, I think we'll focus on Iran as the security challenge, but then the economic opportunities, I'll finish with this, the economic opportunities uh, are significant, both in the region uh, from the Abraham Accords uh, for 
the relationship between Israel and, and the UAE and Bahrain, the other parties to the Abraham Accords, but the Biden administration recognizes that by continuing to build upon that, uh, to, to bring more countries uh, into the tent, we're going to both be advancing our own interests and the interests of our allies, but we're also, by focusing on, on economic opportunities, we'll also be strengthening the security opportunities and the security needs that we all, uh, that we all face in the region and beyond. Thank you. Uh, just a short follow-up question on the sure. JSPOA, the, the deal uh, that uh, President Trump ended uh, with the Iranians. Um, the feeling is now that uh, the new administration wants to, do the new administration want to go back to the old JSPOA or is it a renewed one? Uh, and you said that it also will happen in dialogue uh, with uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, but uh, the Israelis don't want any deal uh, with the Iranians on this because they say a deal uh, will then just lead to uh, the fact that they will just, um, you know, uh, prosper economically and then they will use this uh, on other undertakings uh, around the world. And I guess this is also quite a difficult issue inside both the Senate and uh, the Congress. But of course, you have the majority there now. Um, sure. Look, the again, I think it's important, Borgay, to, to acknowledge the moment that we find ourselves in since leaving the JCPOA. Iran is now further down the line toward uh, both toward the, the movement toward a, a nuclear uh, capability um, and moving outside of the terms of the JCPOA. So diplomacy is key. And just this week, the uh, the administration again made clear an interest in reviving nuclear diplomacy and and returning to the JCPOA if Iran comes back into compliance. Uh, but also throughout this entire through the campaign and and the early days of the administration, they've also been clear that it's important for us to consult with our allies in the region uh, and um, and focused on. Uh, lengthening and strengthening the deal. Those are words that we've heard consistently, and I think that they're they're important. And those are the kinds of conversations that are going to be taking place um, with with all of our allies, um, all of whom share the same goal of both preventing Iran from developing nuclear weapons, from preventing Iran from its uh, furthering its malign activities in the region, uh, and uh, specifically on the issue of, of precision guided missiles and, and their, their missile technology, uh, making sure that we're moving on that. But Iran has to come back into the compli into compliance with the deal. That's the initial step, and that's as, that's the, the critical piece of this diplomatic effort at the outset. No, that's very interesting. So they need to then uh, do something with the refu uh, re uh, 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 and, and also then get into uh, compliance and then you can restart uh, the discussion. Uh, I also have to uh, call on the only Republican uh, among uh, the four of you or I will be accused of um, being partisan uh, here. Uh, Adam uh, Kinsinger, um, great to see you again, Adam. When you listen uh, to the senator and to your colleague now, uh, Deutsch, uh, and see uh, the new foreign policy that is laid out by the Biden administration. Um, what can you support and, and what are your concerns? Yeah, it's going to blow your audience away. I think there's a lot that we can work together on. And, and quite honestly, I do think maybe we've forgotten a little bit and kind of last few years, but uh, there is a lot Republicans and Democrats agree on. Overseas. First off, there are three Democrats, and I like them all, so that's going to make headlines too. Um, but yeah, I think you know, look on the on the Iran deal specifically. Um, there there is some agreement, which is we do want to get back into a deal. I think the key is to make sure that that deal is something that prevents Iran malign activities. Because why is it that we care about Iran having nuclear weapons? Because they're not a good player in the region. And uh, and that's going to be important. You know, things like uh, reestablishing strong ties with NATO, you know, working multilaterally is important, I think, on trade policy, uh, actually fighting trade fights with allies instead of taking on all kinds of trade fights at once, especially when it comes to protecting and defending ourselves against, you know, unfair Chinese trade practices. And I think the other thing is to be pretty good agreement in terms of how do we go after uh, the biggest competitor, frankly, right now, which is China. You know, how do we defend ourselves economically, our allies, strengthen alliances, build a military that, you know, isn't stuck in the 20th century, but can compete, whether it's in space and information and, and everything to deter 
uh, Chinese activity, uh, malign activity, so that we don't end up in any kind of an armed conflict, and also on Russia. Uh, I think the policies of the last administration on Russia were good. What I didn't like was the fact that, you know, the words spoken about Russia weren't. I mean, ne never a, line, a malign word said about Vladimir Putin. Well, I think I'm hopeful that the Biden administration can match policy actions such as stopping Nord Stream 2, which I know there's disagreement with our allies on, uh, as well as matching that with the rhetoric, because Vladimir Putin knows he will advance in a region or anywhere just until he hits a brick wall. And we need to both verbally and physically set that brick wall there. So yeah, there's gonna be disagreements um, as there always are. There are gonna be members of Congress on both sides that try to make all these issues political, but the core of the defense kind of group in Congress or in the White House, I think understands that areas where we can all work together, it's really beneficial to uh, America and our allies. No, thank you. Thank you so much for that. I guess one of um, the areas where there is a lot of bipartisanship is maybe uh, one of the most crucial foreign policy um, uh, issues moving forward is the G2, the relationship uh, between the US uh, and China. Uh, Congressman, do you think it was a cardinal, a cardinal mistake of the former administration to drop the TPP? Uh, you know, uh, also then uh, building a trade alliance in East Asia where the US was a part? Because the thinking behind that, uh, I understood, was that it would also in infuse some check and checks and balances. And if you agree, do you think there is a way of um, uh, taking up that option again, or is it dead? So I don't think it's dead. And, you know, keep in mind in the 2016 election, uh, both Hillary Clinton, as far as I remember, and Donald Trump said TPP is dead. And I thought that was a huge mistake, you know, to, to build. We have a lot of great allies around China and to be able to create a construct where, in essence, the United States as a significant part in writing the trade rules, which typically benefits everybody, and then to compete with China in unfair trade practices surrounded by free trade allies of the United States, I think would be great. You know, I, I was in Australia a few years ago and they made an interesting point. They said, you know, sadly, not by our, not by our beliefs, but the U.S. is our security partner. And unfortunately, China has become our economic partner. And so I think if this administration can re-engage, ensure, of course, that we're defending, you know, American producers and consumers, but find areas where we can plug back into TPP, even if there has to be some renegotiation, I think the partners in TPP would be all in. And I think that would be massively beneficial to allow the free market itself to align differently given, frankly, COVID pandemic and unfair treatment in China. And, uh, and I think it's beneficial for, for the world, frankly, when it comes down to, to uh, fair trade. Adam, um, I understand that you were one of the 10 uh, representatives on the Republican side uh, in the House that voted to accept um, the um, recommendation uh, from the Electoral uh, College. Uh, is that uh, correct? And um, why did you do that? And how has that been received uh, in the Republican Party? So there are about 80 that voted or 90 that voted to accept the electoral recommendation. I voted to impeach. Um, look, it was, uh, it's, you know, within the base, it's not accepted very well. They're pretty upset. Um, my hope and my belief is that over time, uh, leadership is not about just doing what, you know, people say. In some cases, that's important. But you also have to lead. You have to present a vision. And I think for too long, both parties, but I can particularly talk about the Republican Party since I am one, has been more interested in what does it take to get elected and less interested in how do we lead people to a to a, a bright future. So that's what my goal is, is to present that vision and try to lead the party. And, uh, and I think it was important, especially given the events of January 6th, uh, to put a red line down and say, when you start to, to question without evidence the election integrity of the United States, the only thing that makes a democracy and a republic survive is the belief that when you go to vote, your vote counts. If that somehow is, is told that that's not the case and there's some secret alliance that actually controls things, it leads to violence and a failure of democracy. And as your other three guests will tell you, 
it's now a little more difficult for us to talk to leaders of other countries about how to do democracy in this short moment. I think it'll change. And I think actually the lesson is, look, democracy held through all of this. In fact, a few hours later, we were down doing the work of the American people. But the bottom line is I can't sit by and watch this kind of destruction happen and feel at peace with myself in the position that 700,000 people put me in. Well, thank you for sharing that. L let's move to uh, Representative Stephanie uh, Murphy. You're also uh, an expert on security policy. Uh, you worked a lot on that uh, also uh, in the past. Um, I saw that uh, President Biden had his first uh, also uh, call with NATO Secretary General uh, Jens Stoltenberg uh, yesterday. Will there be uh, a new approach uh, to NATO and Article 5. Can uh, people in Europe look at this differently than they did the last four years? I certainly think there will be a new approach, not just to NATO, but to our other alliances and our partnerships across the world. And I think that's critically important in this particular moment. You know, um, when we look at the global challenges that are facing the United States, whether it's Russia or China, North Korea, Iran, Venezuela, terrorism, pandemic disease, you know, the whole range of um, issues really can be addressed best when we do it um, shoulder to shoulder with our allies. And um, I think one of the big challenges that we face when it comes to nation states, and this is where I think organizations like NATO um, uh, plays is that when we think about the bad actors, uh, or not bad actors, I would say maybe our adversaries or folks who are challenging uh, the global world order, what they are trying to do is to keep the whether that's cheating the system through cheating on trade rules or arms, and they're trying to do so in hopes that nobody. I think alliances and global institutions are mechanisms by which we can hold these actors to account so that they uh, both benefit from the um, uh, benefits of being a part of the global world order, but they do so with the responsibility of behaving in a responsible way. And um, I, I certainly think that we are seeing an era of better relations with our allies, and it makes us stronger on a foreign policy and national security front when we are working together. And when do you expect uh, President Biden to call uh, for this alliance of democracies that he mentioned during the election campaign? I think also Secretary Blinken underlined that. And how will that alliance look? I think they're probably already laying the framework. I think one of the most exciting things and hopeful things for me is that um, the Biden administration has staffed their national security team with um, uh, old hands, basically, folks who have been involved in the execution of foreign policy and, and national security for some, for some time, with Jake Sullivan at the national, as the national security advisor, Tony Blinken at the State Department, Lloyd Austin at the Department of Defense and the Congress just provided him a waiver so that he can serve there in that capacity as a former um, military uh, general. And then Bill Burns at the CIA and Apple Haynes at the DNI. That is a powerhouse team. And I am certain that they are already laying the groundwork for um, pulling together this uh, alliance. And the other thing that's really refreshing and the reason why I'm confident that they're already laying the groundwork for this is that these are all people, with the Biden administration, you see a return to policymaking, um, whether it's on the domestic front or the foreign policy front, um, in normal predictable ways. So, you know, policy papers are written, memos are written, people are briefed. Um, they build uh, stakeholder support, so they're doing outreach to the Hill. All of these things that allows the United States to speak with one voice, as opposed to watching the erratic um, Twitter feed of one individual. This is a team that's working together to ensure um, that we have a coherent uh, strategy um, as it relates to our allies and our adversaries, and um, that we as a nation are united behind it. And I think that's incredibly important when we talk about strong and smart uh, national security. 
Thank you so much. I just want to uh, remind uh, the watchers that uh, you can also submit, send us uh, questions, um, and uh, um, the senator and the Congress representatives are willing to also answer uh, those. I want to go back to you, Senator, um, on China-US relations, because this is probably uh, the most defining uh, question for this decade. Um, China, 20% of the global GDP, uh, US at 25, but also China now with much more uh, military capacity than before. So there are different schools here, those that want to do a full decoupling, uh, the US system and allies of the US keeping one system and then uh, uh, China and potential allies, or should there be areas where you can um, collaborate and then there are areas where you will uh, decouple and how to find the right balance here. Uh, President Xi Jinping on Monday during one of our sessions here in Davos Agenda Week, he really uh, was concerned about the new Cold War. So what, where uh, are you on this and uh, where do you think the Biden administration uh, will be heading? I think uh, President Trump's approach to China was deeply destructive. Um, he would uh, create enormous division um, and created a trade war that really harmed the U.S. economy and different sectors of the economy severely. For example, in agriculture, um, when I was running for president in Iowa, I talked to pork producers and corn producers and ethanol producers. and. Uh, their number one, two, and three buyers were China. So when you're at a trade war and your markets are dried up, it really hurts the economy. Um, President Trump w didn't have a plan or strategy in place to deal with technology. Uh, when he wanted to attack TikTok, for example, as a possible Trojan horse, he not only uh, was extremely aggressive, but then as soon as some of his buddies got in on the deal and had an economic incentive to allow TikTok to stay in the United States, he stepped back. And so that creates instability and, and it undermines norms. So I believe under the Biden administration, there will be a much more thoughtful approach with regard to China. We do need to stand up to China when they break the rules and when they dump steel on the market and do other unfair trade practices. But President Trump spent so much time devaluing and dismissing international organizations. Many of them couldn't do their jobs well. Uh, the World Trade Organization, for example, um, did not have President Trump's support. So under President Biden, he will restore the norms. He will restore the stability of international organizations. and he will be able to address China a little more directly. I think President Biden should look at the entire array of issues where we can get along with China. We should be engaged very aggressively economically. The more we pull them in, the more we create ties, the more we do joint ventures, many of our other values, I think, will begin to transfer. I think it's important to recognize that China has undermined human rights horribly during the Trump administration. What's happened to the Uyghurs in particular is deeply disturbing with forced sterilizations uh, and other huge humanitarian and human rights abuses. But I do think if we can focus on engagement, we might have more sway in influencing how China sees other issues. Um, if we are stronger partners economically, we may be able to then begin to take on shared national security threats. Um, in the world of cyber, we need more global cyber norms, and that might be something we could engage with China on productively. Uh, we have to make sure that we respond and understand threats that China is creating, whether it's in their military technology development or in where they send their military assets. But again, the more we are engaged economically, it will incentivize China to be less aggressive because of those ties. And so I think we need a new approach towards China, one that is clear eyed and understanding of the types of violations that China often makes. But perhaps if we can engage more 
thoroughly on these many levels, uh, we will have better responses when it comes to issues like humanitarian issues and defense issues. So my suspicion is that there will be firm engagement um, and lines will be, um, parameters will be delineated, but I do believe a more robust engagement strategy will result in better outcomes for the world community and for shared goals like climate, like cyber security and new norms and like anti-terrorism. Thank you, Senator. Uh, you heard a representative, um, Adam, uh, he mentioned also the possibility, or I asked him and then he uh, said he uh, would possibly support a revival of the TPP. Uh, is that something you would support? So I think it is something that President Biden will begin to explore. I think he might want to look at the role the United States could play in creating uh, maybe a new version of TPP. But for a senator from New York, um, we look at trade agreements, typically all senators do, based on whether it has a regional positive impact or a regional negative impact. And I did not support the TPP because I didn't think the Obama administration had effectively argued or negotiated provisions to stop corporations from having outsized influences and outcomes where they had disproportionate power to smaller governments and smaller countries with regard to the air and the water and um, different types of protections that different jurisdictions might put in place. Um, those are the kinds of things that President Biden and Vice President Harris care deeply about. So I wouldn't be surprised if they re-engaged on a new TPP, and I would certainly support their efforts to try to negotiate even stronger uh, protections for workers and protections for environmental regulations across the globe. It is a way that we can project our values. And that's what every president wants to do. So I suspect he will take the opportunity to begin that process. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Representative uh, Kinsinger, uh, you heard the Senator um, outlay, outlying uh, or, or laying out, uh, to be more precise, uh, possible China policy. What's your view on uh, what you said? Uh, do you think that's uh, balancing that you would agree with? Or would you go tougher or would you trade more? Well, look, with all due respect, and I and I, I think, you know, the senator laid out a really good plan. I, I disagree with parts of it. First off, I think further, deeper economic ties with China is exactly the mistake we've made over the last number of decades. You know, we were under this belief that if we brought China into the kind of the world community, that they would, you know, change their ways. And in fact, what we saw is they took that for granted, took advantage of it. You know, American companies that go there and get their intellectual property stolen, cyber attacks, cyber intrusion. Um, so I think I look at China slightly differently, but I, I do think it's not going to be a total decoupling. I, I think there are going to be areas we have to decouple. There are areas where U.S. and allied national security is basically dominated and controlled uh, by the Chinese government and the Chinese economy. You look at rare earth minerals, for instance, and things along that line. So I think we have to, as allies, kind of get past the politics of the moment and look at areas where we do have a real concern. You know, the F-35 fighter jet, for instance, I, I don't know what it is, maybe like 800 pounds or something crazy like that uh, are rare earth minerals. And uh, you can imagine what happens if we get into conflict with China uh, and all of a sudden that's a concern. So I think we have to be clear-eyed about it. I think, you know, working with allies, for instance, on our farmers, right? So I have a huge agricultural district too. My farmers were all in, in many cases, on fighting China, even though it cost them because they understood uh, what was at stake. And I think that's where alliances to say things like, if China decides to buy corn from somewhere else, you have to stand with us and refuse to sell them corn, for instance, so that we can all work together for a more fair policy. And then just, just lastly, I'll say this. Um, the reality is China has a lot of questions to answer about COVID, a lot of questions about why were they buying up massive amounts of PPE before we knew this virus existed? You know, why was ta Taiwan ignored in the WHO? Why did Tudros cast the Thai vote against declaring this a pandemic? Why are inspectors not allowed to do full inspections? Why have documents been destroyed. And, uh, and I think that's really important to get to the bottom of because as allies, 
China is going to come in with probably a lot of free money and incentives when we have hurting economies. And we need to be clear eyed about what that comes with, the strings it comes with, the debt diplomacy, and say, you know, in the long run, uh, we've got to stand together. That's why I'm, I'm critical of the Trump administration on, you know, the, the kind of blowing up of alliances. But I also do think we need to continue to be clear eyed about the fact that China's not our friend and they don't intend to be our friend. We engage with them to an extent. We don't seek war with them, but we also have to defend ourselves. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, I think we discussed around 35 minutes without uh, really uh, getting into uh, COVID. That was like a COVID-free zone for 35 uh, minutes, but it is a, a terrible pandemic. We know that uh, uh, a lot of people uh, really, really are badly affected. A lot of people have uh, passed away. I want to uh, go to you, Representative um, Deutsch, again. We all follow also uh, the situation uh, in uh, the US here. We are also faced now what, with what is called like um, vaccine nationalism. Uh, countries are now competing uh, to keep their vaccines, get their people uh, also vaccinated. But one of the things that we have seen is uh, COVID um, anywhere is COVID everywhere. And we have seen that the new strains, the new variants, they come in countries uh, where there is less vaccination. And um, if there are new variants, maybe the vaccines will not work. And maybe later on, if you have vaccinated all your people, it can come back. So how to, uh, of course, have a domestic policy on vaccination and fighting COVID, but also making sure that um, this is a global issue. Uh, COVID doesn't know any borders. Well, you're exactly right. It's, it's really challenging um, as we're confronting this to, to try to deal with this on a country by country basis, because as you point out, this is a global pandemic. This is not just a question of what, what happens in the United States and the decisions we make here. But Corey, that's the reason why it's so important for the United States to re-engage. It's the reason why rejoining the World Health Organization is paramount. It's the reason why the first meeting that the United States participated in uh, with, with the World Health Organization uh, featured Dr. Fauci. Uh, only by working together, only by recognizing the challenges that we face globally will we, will we be able to overcome this. And that means even looking beyond just the immediate questions of air travel to and from uh, uh, countries and, and seeing that travel shut down, but, but ultimately looking out to how to ensure that the vaccines will, uh, will actually get out to the world because we're only going to be in a position to fully crush this virus when, uh, when we're, we've dealt with it globally. And that gets back actually to a lot of the conversations that we've been having already about um, how to ensure that, that we're engaged with other countries uh, and with the private sector to make the vaccine available and make it available everywhere. Thank you. Um, of course, it's quite amazing that uh, in less of a year you, we have uh, developed all these vaccines. Usually it takes eight to 10 years uh, to uh, develop. So that's a major uh, breakthrough. But at the same time, I, I, it's very interesting to hear how you uh, think um, the US have handled this pandemic. So let me uh, go to you, Stephanie uh, Murphy, again. Um, from a scale from an A plus to an F, where, where do you think the U.S. is on handling uh, this pandemic uh, so far? I'm going to be a bit careful here, but it would be very good to hear your own grading of the handling of the pandemic in the U.S., the largest economy, most powerful nation in the world. Well, um, let me just say that I used to be a Department of Defense uh, um, national Security specialist, and I did work on pandemics and um, benchmarked against what are the standard operating procedures when you are trying to deal with a pandemic. I would have to say that um, I'm going to, and also a former um, college instructor, I would say that we're still at an incomplete um, as far as a grade. But to date, um, under the Trump administration, I think there were some uh, very big missteps. And that was the politicization of the pandemic. The virus did not care whether we were Republican, Democrat, or independent. 
it just needed a warm body to um, you know, inhabit and then spread through. And the politicization of the basic um, health hygiene um, mechanisms, the low tech mechanisms to keep our communities safe, like masks and hand washing and social distancing, really set the country back because we still have a significant number of Americans who do not believe that COVID is a real thing. They have bought into the idea that it is a conspiracy theory um, that was created by Democrats, to which I say, well, Democrats must be awfully convincing because we have convinced the entire world that COVID is a reality. Um, and that has actually set us back here in this country because people aren't willing to take the bare minimum um, uh, me uh, measures to keep themselves and their communities safe. Additionally, I think the logistics and the communications around uh, the pandemic has been lacking. The communications has been inconsistent and it has been led by politicians. In a pandemic, the people who should be front and center are health uh, experts. And they were often sidelined or uh, forced into situations that were uncomfortable. I believe Dr. Fauci said he often felt like the skunk at a picnic because he wanted to talk about facts and science and the administration wasn't open to that. Um, additionally, on logistics, trying to take care of a country as large as ours um, and help deliver testing and contact tracing and now the vaccine distribution you need to have a robust logistics uh, operation. And quite frankly, um, the past administration wasn't up to task on that. They promised a lot, but didn't quite deliver on those things. And it left it to be a bit of a Hunger Games situation with the states all competing for uh, resources of PPE and, and now vaccines. So the good news though is that that we now have the Biden administration that has laid out a plan for how it intends to uh, use bonds. And it has asked the Congress for the resources to be able to respond. And we're working hard on that to ensure that we can get those resources out so that the Biden administration can implement its plan and so that we can put this virus behind us and uh, begin to look towards the things we need to do for an economic recovery and, um, and just stop the needless loss of life. Oh, thank you. Uh, Senator, uh, it was uh, called even a hoax, uh, a bluff, uh, in the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, do you think there are many million Americans that still think this uh, is not uh, for real? First question. And the second one, uh, when we watched what unfolded uh, the 6th of uh, January, um, I think uh, we were um, really, really uh, not believing what we were seeing. I, I guess the four of you were at the Capitol uh, that day too, and uh, no uh, law enforcement is, is following up on this. How long will it take uh, to build a more inclusive, uh, and you will see a less uh, America that is less polarized? Will it take decades, or do you think this can heal much faster um, than we can anticipate. If you look back at history, it has been also this kind of polarization before. We should not forget that, and you know that uh, much better than we do, but uh, how do you feel? Because you're a lot out w with also your constituents. Yes, um, so January 6th was deeply disturbing. It was frightening for the members of Congress that uh, where they are trying to complete our elections and finalize the electoral college vote. But the anger and the violence that the protesters and rioters uh, brought to the Congress and brought to our place of, 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 of governing um, was pretty severe and disturbing. Uh, the hatred and anger is still present throughout the country. Unfortunately, President Trump does bear responsibility. Uh, he did incite that crowd to insurrection. He did tell them to march on Congress. And his statements in the weeks preceding um, really left it open to people thinking they had to take this into their own hands, which would lead many of them to believe that the president meant violently. 
So we will do our impeachment uh, trial in the Senate. Uh, we will address that in the next couple of weeks and we will have transparency and accountability. But your broader question, how long does it take to heal? President Biden said he wants to heal the soul of America. He ran as a healing candidate, one who wanted to bring the country together. And I have every faith he will use his position as president to do exactly that. But I believe to start healing, we need transparency, we need accountability, we need justice. Those are the kinds of things that people need to see because they need to understand, is, does the constitution not matter anymore? Do, do our laws mean anything? And the way you do that is certainly holding the rioters accountable individually, but you also need to hold accountable the news services that aren't news, that are opinion, that we need oversight and accountability over cons ultra right-wing conservative media that doesn't tell people that what they're saying is opinion and not fact. We need oversight over the social media platforms. They're was insufficient regulation, oversight, and accountability for these various um, online groups and online organizing platforms that were sell that were selling and distributing lies, saying that the election had been stolen, um, uh, creating groups to create insurrection and create a response that was violent. We have to do our job in Washington to create more accountability. But I am a person of faith and, you know, I am a Christian and I believe that our job is to love one another as each as ourselves, to treat each other as we want to be treated. That is the golden rule and that is part of our Judeo-Christian heritage in this country. And we've lost sight of that. We've lost sight of the notion that we should care for the least among us, that we should care for the people who are homeless, in poverty, hungry, immigrants, people who are incarcerated. Those are divisive issues in Washington, but they shouldn't be. They should be common ground. And I think if we start focusing on helping the least among us, listening to one another, finding where the fear and anxiety lies and trying to create security there instead is how you will heal this nation. Um, I think it is incumbent upon all of us to do that now because we do not want a violent future. And I think we can. And that's what I try to do in my state. You know, when I was first elected in 2006, I was elected to a two to one Republican district. All my mayors and town supervisors were Republican. And so I always listened. And it's why I always try to start legislation with Democrats and Republicans at the table together to write it from the beginning. I think it's the best way to govern. It's how President Biden wants to govern. And then just last, you mentioned um, your first question was about COVID and that and that people don't know it's it's dangerous. Um, again, that starts with accountability on the social media platforms, on the news media platforms. Uh, and it also starts with our government. And one of the ideas that I've put forward is for a global One Health and Spillover Surveillance Act as an initiative to create um, a working group between all of the agencies that are responsible. It's akin to the 9-11 report that we called for after 9-11 because there was so much siloing of national security information. Well, that siloing still exists when it came to global health information and to stopping something like a pandemic. So we need to coordinate amongst our government and our agencies and bring together expertise to make recommendations to Congress so that we can avoid this kind of pandemic in the future. And part of that has to deal with facts and making sure that facts are given the credibility and the weight that they used to get and have not gotten under the Trump administration. And so that is part of our responsibility to address this pandemic right now and to begin to heal the country. Thank you so much. Uh, moving over to you, Adam, I heard um, said the golden rule, how long uh, will this uh, polarization last? Uh, is it possible uh, to heal? I guess uh, you might even uh, in the future be telling your grandchildren how you voted also on the impeachment uh, piece. You said that was a question of integrity and moral for you. So uh, also very interesting to hear uh, your reading of this. Yeah, look, I mean, that, that was the easiest vote I've ever taken, honestly. And uh, I don't mean it was easy like I, I didn't care. It was an easy decision. It was a tough vote, easy decision. And, uh, you know, and I think that's part of healing and moving forward and saying something's not okay. 
Uh, when it comes to the pandemic, I mean, look, I predicted actually in March that masks would become political because everything is, and it did. I didn't know I'd be right, but I was. And, I, and that's like, you know, this idea that we will never wear a mask because it's oppression. But it's also, you know, if I'm outside by myself alone and somebody yells at me for not having a mask on, that's silly, too. We just need to do common sense things. The big problem is social media. We have allowed ourselves to be radicalized because we we are outperforming the human brain now in information. So the the the, the platforms, in essence, that are feeding us information are outperforming our ability to think rationally. We're going from seeing news for one hour a day to about 12 hours a day. Uh, we're allowing ourselves to see the other side as the enemy and not you know, strategic competitors within the political system. And so I think part of it is, yes, leaders have to tell the truth for sure. My party bears, bears all the responsibility for January 6th. The president does. Um, but we also need to have told the truth. And I called out QAnon, for instance, a year ago, and people said, you shouldn't be giving them attention. I said, I think we're already too late. We have to be open and honest with that. Uh, we have to be compassionate to the people that have fallen prey and understand that that's like deprogramming them, you know, from a cult and show them the truth, show them information. And I think we need to be realistic about what the goals are. I, you know, you'll never have real like unity in this country. I think we can be unified as Americans. But like the Republican Party, for instance, instead of trying to unify with the Democrats, because we have big differences, but it should go back to being the loyal opposition. We, we, will be, we will be true to our conservative beliefs and oppose where we must, but we're also going to be loyal to America above all else. I, for instance, you know, served for six years, I guess, under President Obama. I never once said a bad word about him when I was overseas because to me, first off, that doesn't help if I tell somebody. It just makes us look bad. If we can get back to that and then see each other as humans that have different opinions will be all right. And I, I'm more optimistic that it won't take decades. It may, be a, it may be a rough few years, but we'll get there. Now, I know you have a distinguished army um, background. Uh, were you in the, uh, in the Congress uh, the 6th of uh, uh, January yourself? I was, and I was on the floor at the very kind of beginning of when they broke the barricades. I went to my office. And I'll tell you, it was it was one heck of a day. You know, I took my gun to work, actually, which I, I usually carry a uh, pistol wherever I go, except onto the Capitol complex because there's so many police. But I kind of had predicted violence for weeks before that. So, you know, at one point I was barricaded in my office. And for about 20 minutes, when we didn't know exactly the extent of the breach, um, I thought I may have to defend myself. That is not a feeling that the United States of America should have. And as much as I condemned, for instance, the riots in the summer, there is no comparison between the riots in the summer and an attack on a branch of democracy that underpins whether or not we can actually govern ourselves uh, or not. And so uh, to me, it, is a, it was a very tragic day, but I think in the long run, the story will be positive, which is democracy even in the face of this held. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, Stephanie, uh, your connection is a bit uh, shaky. So uh, if you, um, I'll come back to you after um, uh, Ted, but uh, if you can look into it. Uh, I was thinking, uh, Congressman Deutsch, uh, after also hearing now um, what Adam said about social media, media, can democracy survive social media the way we see it today without uh, any more restrictions? Uh, it's a really important question, Borgia, and I, I appreciate it, but I, I just like to take a moment and expand the conversation. This is the World Economic Forum, and, and I'm, I am always happy, and we're American legislators, and so I'm happy to talk about what's happening in America, but let's remember that we're having this conversation as, uh, as, Uyghurs in China continue to be in, put into camps as Navalny sits in prison, um, as, uh, as Maduro can, runs Venezuela, and, and I could go on and on. The rise of authoritarianism, the threats to democracy globally, globally, um, did not start in the United States, did not happen as a result of the pandemic. These are challenges that we must face together globally. And, I, and, and even after, we talked before about the global nature of the pandemic, but the, the pandemic of, of authoritarianism is, 
uh, is what we're going to be battling and the fight for democracy and human rights and free expression and the role of, of a free press. That's what's going to be front and center for years to come. I think it's going to be the most defining issue that all of us tackle around the globe in the coming decade. And, and social media, to your point, social media is a part of that. And, uh, and there is responsibility that comes with, uh, with the decisions that for-profit companies make about what they're going to allow on their platforms. That's a conversation that has started uh, in this country that has gone a little further in other countries and, and that uh, this Congress, uh, I believe, will take up in a very serious way. This is, this is not just a, a question of, uh, of certain voices and whether or not we deem something censorship or, or not. This is about um, how companies, platforms are used to advance voices that pose threats to the very democracy that that we celebrate and ought to celebrate uh, and that we will be defending, as I said, uh, for weeks and months and years to come, both here and around the world. No, thank you so much for uh, sharing that, Ted. And I think uh, the fact that we have one senator and three representatives from the Congress here uh, discussing uh, for an hour uh, so uh, deep, uh, also um, quite complicated issues in a free way, of course, uh, speaks uh, to democracy uh, in uh, in the U.S., but I think also the expectations uh, of, for and from the U.S. is is very high globally. Let me then, since we only have three minutes uh, left, and we are a Swiss organization, so we should be on Swiss time and end on time. Uh, let's hope your connection is better, uh, Stephanie. Um, we are looking at a lot of also new threats. Um, I mentioned. Um, also, uh, of course, uh, dealing with social media, but we know cyber uh, is uh, very much out there, attribution, how to react, but also we, we see that terrorism is still there. We also have asymmetric uh, conflicts. Uh, we see that countries use also uh, proxies uh, in attacking each other. So very complex security picture. How do you think the Biden administration will reform um, uh, the military and the U.S. to be better prepared uh, for the new realities. Thank you so much for um, coming back. And apologies about the technology here. Um, but I do think that um, there are a lot of challenges that we can um, take on. But we're not going to just get the solutions from government. We're going to also have to rely uh, on industry to help us approach that wide range of challenges that you laid out. And I think my um, community in Florida is a great example of places in America that represent the kind of innovation and um, American can do itness that will help us uh, um, address these problems. And a really great example is that we have um, two places in Central Florida, one that is um, uh, uh, an area that supports national security. It works on modeling simulation technology and cyber, and it has universities in that location. It has private companies there. It has government, military um, branches, all working together to address these issues. And then a little further south in our district, we have an area called Lake Nona, and they are becoming um, a, a hub for health sciences, you know, the places where you solve problems like vaccines for pandemics. They have um, incredible technology, and they're bringing together uh, communities, education, the sciences, and just the innovation. From the government perspective, what we can do is to ensure that they have a level playing field on the global stage and set the stage so that we can unleash American innovation and work with our allies to address these big issues, set good international standards for how we work together um, and how we can uh, ensure that, you know, um, the uh, technology and products that come out of uh, democracy-loving countries are the ones that dominate, especially at a time when we see authoritarian countries trying to push their products and their values through their products all across the world. And I will wrap up where we started, which is to say this has been a great 
um, session and I found myself agreeing with Adam on a wide range of things, whether that's the United States relooking um, TPP as a way to counter China or the problems of radicalization within our country and, and, and the need to address that so that we can um, call out the, the problems here and move forward to a brighter America, living into our American values. And so I'm ending optimistic. I'm optimistic about um, government's role, the private sector's role, our ability to work with our allies, our ability to work with our colleagues in Congress to get things done for this new century that, while it presents a lot of challenges, also offers a lot of opportunities. Well, thank you so much. Um, I would also uh, say that the U.S. Uh, is very privileged to have leaders like yourself. I think we've all been very impressed um, with the answers. Uh, the U.S. is in uh, good hands. Um, we hope for a little bit more of the golden rule. We hope of a little bit less uh, partnership. We hope for a little bit more of uh, uh, cooperation. But um, I would like to thank you so much for being with us for a full hour answering um, all the questions. World Economic Forum is very proud to have hosted you. So thank you so much and uh, have a great weekend. Hoping to seeing you soon and in the real Davos uh, next year.